So we have just been getting upset after upset after upset. It started off with, you know, the election. Some people call that one an upset. Then you have the Jake Paul versus Mike Tyson fight. Them. Some people call that an upset. Rightfully so, of course. And now we have Kano versus Gaulon part two, Electric Boogaloo. And this one, calling it an upset is an understatement, okay? What we learned is Kano can't lose unless there's someone of high importance in the story. The way that Sandro has narrated him is a fighter who is a mysterious fighter where if he ever got any kind of background or any kind of information about where he came from or how he got so good at fighting, then that's how we know we're at the end of the series. Congratulations. We're nearing the end of the series because we got some backstory on Kano and we also got some backstory on Kaolon as well, but it wasn't really any kind of additional backstory. It was stuff that we already knew. It was just personified finally. And so let me get Kaolon's stuff out of the way first, okay? So what we learned is how Kaolong actually got picked up to be Rama the 13th's bodyguard. And it's through a lot of things, actually. Not really. It wasn't through a lot, realistically. It was because when he was younger, his father, Rama the 12th, actually saw Kaolong's fight. And then he picked him up and said, oh, man, you're actually a really good fighter. You know, we can't give you everything that you want, but you can fight for it. And this was mostly because Kaolong was born to a family that... He had a lot of brothers and sisters, but unfortunately his parents had passed. So the only way for him to provide for them was to either steal or fight. Obviously at that point we scrap him because this is Kaolon, okay? The God, the God of War! The Thai God of War! Then he continued training in Muay Thai for the next 20 years. And during this time he battled countless people who wanted to challenge him for the role of bodyguard. And he also encountered Sao Peng, who was the first person that Kaolon couldn't be. So on and so forth. That's later on how the story goes for him now when we're talking about the past for Kalon, we really didn't get that much new information it was just information that was already known to us it was just like a bit of a recap if you would but with kano on the other hand kano's backstory that's where we get some really good juicy information all right so what we learned is that kano his earliest memory is from him living in the sewers. Now, what does that entail? That means, of course, that he's a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. So if you think about it, if there's an artist out there whose name is Kano, then you know where this is headed. Anyways, he was part of a gang of children that were living in the sewers. They were out here eating rats, bro. They were eating Master Splinter left and right. And so during this like trialing period in his life, he and his friends were all like suffering from the cold, starvation. Some of them actually died out during this time. And it wasn't until the tiger Nico, or as I call him, the uncool Nico, showed up and said, Oh man, fresh me. I mean, hey kids, hey, come with me. Let me help you out for a second, okay? Let me, here, come with me here. I'll get you guys some jackets as well. He treats them like a father figure, essentially. He gives them a sense of humanity, and then he teaches them the Nico style. So as the uncool Nico starts taking Kano and his gang under his wings, they start looking up to him. They start thinking like, oh, wow, this guy is really cool. He doesn't know exactly who we are, and he just helped us out, made us not die of starvation. And now we're just, you know, training underneath him. We're learning how to fight and everything. And that's when... They all learned his true intentions when the goo ritual happened. And as we all know, the ritual took place. And that's when Kano had to essentially fight all of his friends and some other people as well. You got to think about it this way. Like This kind of makes the goo ritual even more sad because these are people that theoretically Kano has known all of his life. Like, bro, these are the people he was in the trenches with. They shared rats with each other, okay? They broke rats with each other, and now they got to kill each other, and Kano is the one that came out on top. Now, before I even talk about the fight again, I'd just like to say, while you guys were out here fiending over Elisa's outfit, I was fiending over the absolute power move that this man, Rama the 13th, pulled onto Yan. When this man, Yan, was over here worrying about, oh my god, Shen, how dare you? Why did you try to give them all power-ups? They're all getting stronger. Why are you doing this to us? Rama just tapped him on the shoulder and said, hey... How's it going, my guy? Or should I call you the head of the worm? Nah, chill out, man. Yeah, loosen up them shoulders. Like, first off, no, Rama is actually kind of jacked. No, he's not jacked. He's like shredded almost. He's shredded. He's not really like bulky strong or anything like that. He's more so on the shredded end. And so just the fact that he had to pull that absolute power move of tapping him onto the shoulder and then acknowledging him as the head of the worm, where obviously Yan is trying to be inconspicuous, 
that was a power play move on Rama's part. We don't really get moments like that anymore where side characters do stuff like that that are actually pretty cool, but I like that. See, this is the stuff that I do like reading whenever I read King Inasura. Keep it up, Sandro. Anyways, let's go on to the actual fight between the weakened state Kano versus the damn near fresh Kaolon. Now, Kaolon actually had a bit of a cakewalk the entire way of this bowl, and this championship tournament, Kaolon had the most easiest route towards it. I mean, if you can argue he didn't really have the easiest route because most of the people that he was fighting were all grappler based fighters. And so having Kaolon going against his biggest weakness, which is grappling, is a true testament to where he's become versus where he was before, where if he was against a grappler in the past, he would just get cooked. But now, since he's against a grappler, he didn't just beat any grappler. He beat Jirota. Dragota, okay? He beat Dragota and then he beat Dubston. But unfortunately, we all know that Dubston was just going to be fodder and just another one of Galon's victims. But the pathway that Galon took compared to the pathway that Kano took were two completely different pathways, okay? Kano had, like, he had a truly rough time going through this entire championship, okay? He had Julius into Lolong. Two fighters that you're not walking out without getting injured, even the slightest. And Kano managed to get out of it with all of his bones still intact. Then you have the match between the two. If you look at the pictures between them, this man, Kao Long, is damn near fresh, okay? He didn't really take any injuries during all of his fights. In fact, he think he got thrown down a total of three times throughout all of his matches, and that was all the damage he took. Meanwhile, Kano has taken blows, elbows, the invisible elbow, the inevitable elbow, then the God told her Steinbolt hurt like three different times, and he is still standing. So... Obviously, if you want to compare like just an HP sense, you would definitely see the HP bar for Kalon for being about out of 100, I would say about 90. Then you got the Kano health bar, which definitely would be around 60 maximum. And I'm being generous on that point because look at him. Even when like you're supposed to be going back out to the ring and everything, this man Kano looks beat up. So Kano even winning the match was more of an upset on Kalon's part because he had the advantage. He had so much more energy in him compared to what Kano went through. Now, that doesn't mean that Jerome Rota and Justin didn't do any kind of damage to Kaolon. They, they do do a little bit of damage to him, but realistically, it wasn't enough to actually stop him from being damn near at full health. So, with this fight out of the way, the only takeaway that I have from it, because, you know, I don't really like talking about the fight, the hitting and everything like that, because that's more like a play-by-play -play kind of thing, and it's not my deal. But, they give Kaolong a new epithet, actually, if you pay attention to it. It's the Avatar of Garuda. Now, the Garuda is something that's very tied to Kaolong especially because if you see in Osprey he has a picture of the Garuda on his shorts. Being called the avatar of Garuda is very fitting for Kaolong because the Garuda represents the virtue of knowledge, power, bravery, loyalty, and it's the Southeast Asian symbol of justice. All these things perfectly make up what is Kaolong. And so I think, you know, I'm not saying take away the Thai God of War, but adding in the epithet of the avatar of garuda kind of makes sense overall i'm rather unhappy about how things turned out i kind of did want kano to lose this match and it's mostly not because i don't like kano and i don't like kano winning i love kano and i do want him to win but i also want him to lose sometimes to someone who's not absurdly just stupidly powerful but that's just my humblest opinion. Let me know what you guys think about the fight down below. I'm probably making a video later on talking about how, you know, the entire Champions Tournament and how it went down. And as Liu said it, fighters who are like on a professional sense in most fiction are seen as jobbers. And the fact that Liu says jobbers in the manga makes it even more hilarious to me. <laughs> so... Take that for what it is. You could then consider Kyle Long to be the super jobber if that's the case. <laughs> With that being said, thank you all for watching. You guys take care. I'll see you for the next one. <laughs> super jobber.